that you're very welcome here. Uh, I appreciate that, uh, the welcome spirit from all of you, especially Julie Bronder uh, with her energetic hospitality. Uh, but still, you have to be a little bit leery about believing all those things that were said about me in that very overgenerous introduction. So in order to uh, set things straight, let me, let me quote to you one of my bird cartoons. People sometimes ask me how I study all these horrible things and still stay sane, if one can make that assumption. And my, answer is, my answer is I draw bird cartoons, and I do I actually publish a couple little booklets of these cartoons. They don't show any artistic talent, but the birds can speak more directly than I can in my other writings. And one such bird cartoon that seems appropriate at this moment, a small, energetic, enthusiastic bird looks up and says, all of a sudden, I had this wonderful feeling, I am me. And an older, bigger, more skeptical, more jaundiced bird looks down at him and says, you were wrong. <laughs> I like to consider that my existential classic. <laughs> I am happy to be speaking here at the Ryan Foundation Conference. Uh, uh, I had hoped that I would share a podium with Margaret Singer, uh, a very close and old friend, as has been indicated. Uh, you know that Margaret was one of America's preeminent psychologists before either she or I had heard of the word cult. Uh, she's a very special person, uh, and nobody in this entire world has devoted anything like the intellectual and moral energy that she <coughs> has uh, to this subject. So because we can't quite share the podium tonight, she, she couldn't get out of a, a commitment that she had, and she's not that strong these days anyhow, I'm going to dedicate this lecture to Margaret. Uh, my subject in general is that of apocalyptic violence. Uh, it's, what is apocalyptic violence? Well, if you look at various forms of large-scale violence, it's not only their scale, but it's the attempt to achieve a, a new spiritual world through that kind of violence. So that if you look at violence in the Middle East, for instance, uh, either on the part of Jewish or Palestinian fanatics, the violence is intended immediately in a political sense to block the movement, the peace process. But its larger impulse is to bring about a holy war or to enhance and speed up the return of the Messiah, depending on which side it comes from. It's that larger purpose of destroying the world in order to renew it that is behind apocalyptic violence. We've got plenty of that in this country, as you know. Uh, I'll return to Timothy McVeigh and, and the Oklahoma City bombing at the end of my remarks. But the violent actions that we see on the part of cultic groups are likely to have that double level, an immediate one, which is lethal and dangerous, and an apocalyptic one, which has to do with an imagined world ending in the service of renewal. Well, when you recognize all this, you can say that there is a worldwide epidemic of ap apocalyptic violence. We can see it in, in the really sad report from Africa just today. And we have to conclude with uh, the great historian, Eric Hobsbawm, the old century has not ended well. In my own work, I've tried to combine a psychological and historical approach. A psychohistorical approach really means the application of psychological methods to studying historical problems. And all that we think or write about concerning cults represents historical problems. Cults are a product of dislocations in all of our societies. In this work, Eric Erickson has been very important because he created a model of the great man or great person in history. And in my work, I've looked at, instead of a single person, what I call shared themes, attempting to interview individuals who belong to groups that have had a particular uh, Im impact on history or who have been acted upon, importantly, by history, uh, and it, usually a little bit of both. And from that standpoint, I've done some of the studies that you heard mentioned. The first one of Chinese thought reform which I did in the mid-50s, really had to do with the issue of totalism, of all or none belief systems and actions. And that has haunted the world, uh, certainly from that time and long before. 
it was in relationship to Chinese thought reform that I came to these very general principles that people found uh, in that notorious chapter 22 of my first book uh, useful. And, I was, and I'm very glad that that's been the case because I might say that through that chapter 22 of that first study, the paths of many people in this room have crossed with my own in ways that have enriched both of us, I feel, uh, all of us. And the first principle, I'll mention, these are known to many of you, but they are kind of best baseline. I'll mention them briefly. The basic, basic principle is milieu control, which means controlling all communication or attempting to in any environment. And then a second principle is what I call mystical manipulation, hidden maneuvers uh, uh, behind the scenes. Uh, third, a demand for purity, division of the world into pure good and pure evil. Uh, there is an ethos of confession because if somebody is kept confessing, you can, can, you can achieve control of his or her guilt and shame mechanisms. And there's no greater control that one can achieve over another human being. Another principle is that of the sacred science. These groups are not content to claim absolute spiritual truth, but must combine it with what they take to be absolute scientific truth. That's very true of Om Shinrikyo. Uh, there is what I call the loading of the language, a rhetoric and a language that only permits the claims of the particular group to be expressed. Alternative claims are blocked out by the very language. Uh, there's another principle, that of doctrine over person. It's very obvious, uh, but not when you're in the middle of it. And that is that any doubts or any critical feelings that one's accurate personal perceptions inform one about are attributed to one's own shortcomings, turned back on one, and that's again another uh, control of guilt and shame. And then uh, one has to embrace the doctrine rather than one's personal uh, discoveries. And finally, the most uh, dangerous dimension of cultic behavior, what I call the dispensing of existence. And that really means that cultic groups so embellish their own claim to absolute truth that they divide the world into those who have a right to exist and those who have no such right. Now, uh, that may be just symbolic in many ways in terms of favors or whatever, but it can become much more dangerous and even murderous uh, as it did with Om Shinrikyo. Well, that was all in connection with my first study and I've always come back to those principles uh, because they relate to the other studies and to these large issues in the world. The second study of Hiroshima survivors, I interviewed people who had been exposed to that first atomic bomb in Hiroshima and lived in that city with my wife and then infant child and uh, got involved in the psychology of survivors and the issue of death in relationship to individual psychology uh, and from that into larger nuclear issues uh, which still bedevil the world. The other study, that of Vietnam veterans, uh, really gave me some of the terminology for this recent book because you remember the imagery of destroying a village to save it. Now groups have upped the ante, so to speak, destroying the world to save it, uh, as I used in my title of this uh, recent book. Uh, but also uh, there was, uh, in connection with Vietnam veterans, a very hopeful dimension because through that work and the rap groups that have been mentioned, we found that people can undergo changes rather rapidly, contrary to what we're taught in psychiatry. Uh, they can, as adults, undergo significant changes uh, and very quickly, even though much of them psychologically may remain as it was. Uh, in my study subsequently of Nazi doctors, I came upon the idea of would-be healers or people who are designated by their society as healers who instead join the killers. And I realized that killing in the name of healing can also be present in extreme cultic behavior, as was true of Om Shinrikyo. <clears throat> there is a more hopeful dimension to my studies, uh, which I expressed in another fairly recent book called The Protean Self, and what that suggests is that each of us now, partly because of the confusions of history, uh, have the capacity for renewal and for openness, uh, for many-sidedness in our sense of individual self, and we need not be stuck in dead ends. 
Ironically, many people who found their way into cults were experimenting with the self, but except they got stuck in a place that became very difficult to leave. In terms of my recent study of Om Shinriki, I'll just really give you something of an overview tonight. It's, uh, you've had a long day and it's not over yet, but uh, I'll try to be brief and at least indicate some of the main themes. I made five trips to Japan uh, each for two or three weeks and interviewed people intensively there between 1995 and 1997. Uh, and I used a similar method of interviewing individual members of this group through careful introductions to them, uh, and at the same time immersing myself in everything I could learn about them from Japanese journalists, Japanese scholars, and also what was being written about them, and about Japanese culture at that time that had contributed to their emergence. Now, you all have been uh, subjected to issues about terminology, and uh, it has been said, and there's much truth in it, that to use the term cult is pejorative, uh, and to use the term new religion is more neutral. That's true. I prefer to be pejorative and to use the term cult, but I then would have to require of myself certain criteria or justifications for doing that. I'll mention three. One is a totalistic or thought reform-like set of practices of something of the kind that I just mentioned. Second is a shift from spiritual principles, uh, worship of broad spiritual principles, to the worship of the person of the leader or guru. And third, uh, a, a tendency of genuine spiritual quest from below. Ordinary people go in with a general, genuine spiritual quest in most cases with considerable exploitation, often economic and sexual, from above. And if a group shows those three characteristics, uh, and, and I'm convinced that I'm willing to call them a cult, but I do think we should be as precise as we can about our terminology in that way. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a cultic journey, say something about what Ohm did, um, something about uh, the relationship between guru and disciples, something about the relationship of Ohm and ultimate weapons, or megalomania and ultimate weapons, a very dangerous combination, something about the characteristics of a violently destructive cult that I came to from this study, and then a word about problems in our own backyard, cultic tendencies of this apocalyptic kind uh, in this country. Because my, my sense has been throughout this work that by exploring the bizarre emotions and actions of Om Shinrikyo, uh, we uncover and better understand closely related impulses in our own country, dangerous tendencies in American society that we need to confront and combat. Uh, what did Ohm do? Well, just many of you are familiar with it. I'll just mention it very, very briefly. Uh, they uh, exploded onto the world stage on March 20th, 1995, with the infamous sarin gas attack in, in Tokyo, the releasing of sarin gas, a very poisonous, uh, lethal nerve gas on five subway trains, the trains leading to the heart of Tokyo and government buildings uh, in that incident. Uh, they had had previous uh, runs of, or test runs, of sarin gas, one of them in Matsumoto a year before, a Japanese city north of Tokyo, another one earlier than that in Australia, uh, where they tried the uh, gas out on animals and wanted to see its effects. Uh, but uh, they also were involved in more immediate hand-to-hand -hand killings over time. Many of these weren't discovered until after the Sarin incident, uh, so that up to 80 people have been killed by Aung San many of them dissident members or people who were designated as enemies of Aung. Uh, they, as you know, uh, created, uh, produced Sarin gas, uh, chemical weapons, and also biological weapons, uh, and uh, botulinus and anthrax, and they were seeking nuclear weapons. They were initiating dialogues with, uh, with alienated scientists in the former Soviet Union in Russia about the possibility of getting nuclear weapons. Fortunately, they didn't get very far in that, and it's very difficult to obtain still uh, or to make nuclear weapons. But all of this was in the service of uh, a triggering of Armageddon. That is, uh, they had planned or began to plan 
a large event in November, that was to be months after what actually happened uh, in March, they rushed their sarin gas in March because they heard that the police were closing in, but they had wanted to release a much more infinite amount of sarin gas in November in order to create a warlike situation in which the Japanese would think the Americans had done it, and the Americans would think the Japanese had done it, other leading countries would join in warfare which would initiate World War III and would trigger Armageddon. Now that's, of course, uh, not exactly logical thinking, but that was the plan, and that was the thought process, uh, and the goal, really, of the cultic behavior, certainly over the last year or two, of its active function. Uh, so that Om Shinrikyo, we have to ask how this came about, crossed a crucial threshold from merely anticipating Armageddon, and that you can find in many cultic groups and in many fundamentalist groups all over the world, to taking active steps to attempt to bring it about. And those steps included the acquisition of ultimate weapons. Uh, so we have uh, an activist Armageddon and the embrace of weapons that could bring that Armageddon about. And that's a historical first uh, in the case of Om Shinrikyo. To say a word about the guru and his myth, uh, uh, in a way, a guru can be seen as either everything or nothing. He is everything, or she, in, in the sense that the guru is responsible for creating the cult, for its policies, for uh, the direction in which the cult moves and its actions. On the other hand, a guru is nothing without disciples. Without disciples, people who become gurus could instead become psychotic. They depend upon, them, in many cases, the disciples for their own uh, mental functioning. And uh, Anthony Storr, a uh, British psychoanalyst, has written a book uh, about um, guru types and talks about uh, their vulnerability, which is why he calls his book Feet of Clay. In the case of Asahara Shoko, who is the guru of Om Shinrikyo, he's now in prison, as you know, uh, it's a story uh, uh, that one could tell at length, but briefly, uh, he is totally blind in one eye and, and mostly blind in another eye, was sent to a school for the blind uh, in Kyushu, one of Japan's southern islands. Uh, he was very resentful to his parents for doing that because he was technically eligible for an ordinary school since he had some sight, but an older brother who was completely blind had been there. It was more convenient economically and in other, way, in other ways for him to be there. Now, uh, this doesn't explain how he became a rather uh, gifted guru. Uh, we can never explain a guru's actions totally by what we know of his or her childhood. But we do want to learn what we can about that childhood. And in his case, elements of his guruism, uh, a certain dimension of uh, aggressiveness, and he was a little bit violent at this school. He manipulated other people because he was bigger and had some sight, and he was very intent on performing in plays. And all these characteristics would later serve him as a guru, but uh, no adult of any kind is a mere product of his childhood. If we think of the self as constantly in motion, and most of our uh, psychological approaches involve a sense of the self, uh, then we know that it's constantly changing and it's never totally predictable from childhood. Uh, nonetheless, a guru tends to feel that he or she has discovered some ultimate human truth and must convey it to the world. A guru can be both convinced of his truth and also a con man at the same time. The two don't eliminate, one doesn't eliminate the other. That was very much the case with Asahara and of many gurus that, that we know of. Um, if we carry over to the guru myth, uh, the guru helps create his own myth to a considerable extent. The guru myth is part of the myth of the hero. Uh, Joseph Campbell and others have taught us that the hero has a certain mythology in any culture, usually a mysterious childhood, uh, a, a mysterious birth and, and, uh, and childhood, then a series of ordeals, a call to greatness, and achieve, achieving of something which Freud called some sort of resolution of the Oedipus complex, but it's really more a discovery of something about death and its significance for life, which he brings back to his people. So a religious guru must have this kind of process in spiritual terms. In the case of Asahara, he 
gives forth a story of having been very much uh, down and confused in his early adult life, and he was in trouble with the law on a couple of occasions, once for violent behavior, once for selling fraudulent Chinese medicines, and he describes how he decided to immerse himself in religion because he had to do something about this. Uh, he had two great visions. A guru must have visions. The first one on which Om Shinrikyo is ostensibly formed, ostensibly formed was a vision that Asahara described being called forth by the Hindu god Shiva, sometimes pronounced as Shiva, to lead an army of the gods in a struggle against darkness. So the vision is one that is both military and spiritual. And the second vision a year later was that of achieving final, final enlightenment in the Himalayas. Uh, I guess that's the ideal place to go for final enlightenment. Uh, in any case, when somebody claims final enlightenment, it's very hard to judge. Who's to say? He's the only one who knows it, who has the experience. However, that didn't stop Japanese journalists. They, they followed his path, they retread his path to the uh, Himalayas and talked to some of the spiritual leaders there, one of whom Asahara had consulted. And, uh, and this man said, well, yes, I sent him to some of the monks in the mountains, and I was surprised when he came back a few days later claiming that he achieve final enlightenment because it takes people uh, most of a lifetime for that achievement. Uh, in any case, uh, there is both the conviction and the self-aggrandizement which one finds uh, in considerable amount in Asahara because in his travels all over the world, uh, one uh, meeting with Dalai Lama, for instance, he had himself photographed with spiritual leaders and then would make uh, exorbitant claims about what they had told him. I'm sure the Dalai Lama is sorry he ever met him because he came back and said that Dalai Lama welcomed him as the great Japanese uh, spiritual leader of Buddhism. Uh, the Dalai Lama has been quick to uh, deny that and I believe in this case the Dalai Lama. Um, <laughs> let me say something about uh, the guru-disciple relationship through the eyes of one very intense uh, disciple whom I call the gentle Armageddonist. Uh, you can have very gentle people who take up fierce theological or ideological actions. This young man was drawn to Asahara and Om largely because of its uh, catastrophic vision that is a vision of the end of the world and of Armageddon and renewal. And you must realize that uh, this kind of vision has been enormously popularized throughout the world in the last year or two, particularly through the writings of Nostradamus. And Nostradamus uh, was the great mystic uh, of the 16th century who claimed that at the year 2000, uh, the world would come to an end. Well, the translations of Nostradamus in Japan have gone through literally 400 printings, sold millions of copies. The Japanese might be the largest consumer of Nostradamus, and of this apocalyptic vision in the world, but it is a worldwide. So this young man had been drawn to that, and he found Asahara talking the same language, so to speak. Uh, just to put it very, very briefly, early in his experience with Ohm, he had a series of what he considered, and others did, mystical experiences. And these were uh, through an intense uh, training in Kundalini Yoga, which Asahara was quite gifted at, and a form of Buddhism uh, practices and especially rapid breathing exercises, which as you know, deoxygenate you and makes you vulnerable for visions. Uh, he did have several visions, as did almost all disciples, visions including the Buddha or Asahara himself. But they considered all of these visions to be a gift of the guru. And these were so intense that they would do anything to sustain them. Several of these young people told me, I knew Ohm was going bad, I could tell from things I saw, but I couldn't leave because I needed Ohm. So the visions become addictive, and you must take that into account when you consider the power of cults. It's not just a matter of brainwashing or thought reform. Of course, thought reform is an important pattern, uh, but there is a, an attraction to the guru uh, in the name of this perfect vision, so that the guru can convey something that we call charisma. People always talk about charisma, but nobody seems to know exactly what it is. It does mean an enormous attraction that some people have, and it has to do, I think, with two psychological dimensions. One is a person with charisma can convey to others the promise of radically new meaning in one's life and new vitality. And a 
an equal promise of belonging to something eternal, some eternal spiritual principle. So it's both vitality and immortality. And that's a rather powerful combination. And that's what this young man experienced, as did uh, all the disciples that I, that I interviewed, 10 former disciples. There are two visions, I'll just mention briefly, that he had specifically. One was of being uh, on a kind of uh, pyramidal, pyramidal structure, in which he was at the bottom of the pyramid, together with another, a group of disciples. Uh, and on top of the pyramid was Asahara himself. And the disciples were drawn irresistibly up to Asahara and merging with him. He considered this a form of a vision of actual experience of reincarnation. And in that uh, process, as he merges with Asahara, uh, he says, uh, am I experiencing nothingness? But that's also Asahara talking. And then there's an answer, yes, you're experiencing for the first time, but that's also he himself talking. It's the merging that is called for in Om Shinrikyo. And again, they use the scientific word of cloning, so that every disciple is meant to become a clone of the guru. The second vision was fairly typical for many Om disciples. In this vision, uh, he and a number of other disciples are sitting very peacefully and going through their meditations, while outside of them, the world is collapsing and the earth is falling into the sea. In a vision that combines uh, nuclear holocaust with biblical Armageddon, it's the idea that the disciples themselves alone and the guru will survive in order to purify the world and bring it a uh, perfect religious experience. Shoko Asahara was simultaneously dignified, ascetic, empathic, supportive, wise, spiritually genuine, innovative, pragmatic, but also childish, inconsistent, fraudulent, manipulative, gluttonous, promiscuous, exploitative, duplicitous, grandiose, schizoid, paranoid, delusional, megalomanic, and murderous. Well, that's a very long list. <laughs> I don't know whether you'd see it through and listen to it. But the point is that the self can be very complex and can have many different components. And that's one source of some of the strength of these gurus. They can be those positive elements to many people who feel that in them, and they, at the same time, have all those dangerous and negative elements. Uh, and, and that's really very important to understand in relation to cultic behavior. Uh, in many ways, uh, Asahara's multiplicity included uh, his eclectic use of religious elements from Buddhism, Shintoism, Hinduism, and a lot of New Age American influence which went into this. Uh, there is a sequence of killing in Om Shinrikyo, or a process, just to give you some idea of how individual killing could extend to the idea of killing the world. Um, I mentioned the individual killings, and the killing process began with one more or less accidental killing, which occurred very early in the cult's experience, its third year, which was 1988. But it wasn't exactly accidental either, because it was through severe practices that uh, one member had been assigned because it was considered that his progress wasn't great enough. So it was punitive as well as accidental. And then in trying to cover up that killing, there were more killings when people wanted to expose it. This has to do with the milieu control and the dispensing of existence that I mentioned before. But there are two larger principles that expand the killing. One is known in ancient Jewish writing as forcing the end. And it comes to simply this. Um, when some people, some Talmudic scholars, came to believe that since it was known that for the Messiah to return, there had to be a lot of violence first, should one initiate violence in order to hasten his return? That concept was called forcing the end, and it, would, it became heretical. Gerson Sholem, the great student of Jewish mysticism, writes about this. So it was rejected as heretical because it was thought that only God should decide the pace of the Messiah's return. Uh, and the second principle, which was related to this, was one called Poa, P-O-A or P-H-O-A, which in original Tibetan Buddhist practice means a spiritual practice when dying, in which uh, a more 
uh, a more enlightened person may help you with this so that uh, as you're dying you can be preparing and enhancing your next incarnation. But in Ohm's distorted hands it became the killing of people by those who were ostensibly spiritually more evolved and the claim that thereby they enhance the next incarnation of the person they've killed. So I gave this what I think is an appropriate term, uh, altruistic murder. Murder for the sake of the victim. Uh, and with those two concepts, of course, uh, one was free, uh, and when and own people, it was only an inner sanctum of people who were really on to the whole process fully, to move back and forth between this kind of uh, murderous ideology or theology on the one hand, and using this as a rationalization for killing, the one being inseparable from the other. Of course, Ohm developed a floor, as did Asahara himself, a florid paranoia. The enemies were the Jews, the Freemasons, the Japanese government, the CIA, various Japanese, whom they called Jewish Japanese. There was a lot of anti-Semitism in Ohm. Uh, but paranoid people can function at a fairly high level intellectually, even when they're overwhelmingly paranoid. Just think of Kaczynski, the Unabomber in this country, and how brilliantly he made his bombs and evaded the FBI and did all kinds of things. Uh, it's when they can no longer control their environment that they may lapse into paranoid psychosis or paranoid schizophrenia. And it's also when they're most dangerous, because when they can't control their environment, they're likely to become more violent with that uh, more psychotic-like behavior. And Ohm's violence was preceded by the fear on the part of Ohm leaders, and especially Asahara, that Ohm would be in some way ended, that they weren't getting enough disciples or enough so-called shuke, or monks, who lived together and were at the heart of the group. Uh, and uh, the functional paranoia then, which is what he uh, existed under, and then becomes collectivized, is accompanied by a functional megalomania. What that means is, in this case, the guru becomes the world. The self of the guru replaces the world. What goes on in the outside world has no significance except as it reverberates through the self of the guru. That's what megalomania really is. And one, again, can function within that megalomania and bring the group into the guru's megalomania, so it becomes a shared megalomania, as long as one is in control of the environments. Uh, the megalomania was represented in many different ways. Asahara was described as a universal genius in every sense, uh, and there were stories about his reincarnation so that he claimed responsibility for building the pyramids in Egypt and really for the whole creation of Western culture. Uh, but the megalomania becomes penetrated, the paranoia and the megalomania and the whole adaptation to paranoia and, meta and megalomania breaks down when disciples turn on the guru. The disciples might be even more important to the guru than the guru is to the disciples in this sense. And one of the most dramatic moments in Ohm's history occurred in court uh, a couple of years ago when Asahar was confronted by a man named Inoue. Inoue was his closest disciple who had, been, had known nothing but Ohm during his entire adult life. And Inoue accused his former master, Asahara, of being a false guru in open court. And people who witnessed this could see Asahara almost collapse in the process. In, in, in court, according to the internet reports, Asahara varies between uh, behaving in schizophrenic-like fashion, that is, accusing the judge and others of bombarding him with uh, radium or whatever, radiation, or else at times he has a sly uh, tendency, much more, uh, quote, logical tendency to blame his disciples for all the violence and say that he is innocent of it. But he has broken down in court uh, with the loss of control over it. Uh, his uh, environment. The danger here, as I suggested early in my remarks, is the combination of megalomania with ultimate weapons. The very existence of ultimate weapons in this world create a lure for megalomanic personalities like Asahara, because they can then come to feel that I alone, or perhaps with a few disciples, can destroy the world. So the technology of the weapons enters into the psychology of the megalomania and paranoia. 
And that's why when people write books about, uh, with the very dubious titles such as Living with Nuclear Weapons, don't believe that this is innocent or safe. Uh, their very existence has this danger in the world, and this is another way to look at it. And certainly Asahara, all of his destructive behavior was uh, in some way bound up with what I call nuclearism. That is, the worship of these ultimate weapons first, uh, and, and this was not unknown in the United States or the former Soviet Union or other nuclear weapons possessing powers. First, fear the weapons, then embrace of that which one is afraid of, the flaunting of the weapons, the embrace of them for national security, for keeping the world going until the weapons become almost deities and you get a psychology of nuclearism. That was very much the case with Asahara. And he considered the chemical weapons and the biological weapons to be the poor man's nuclear weapons, as many people have said, and also what he called energy-saving nuclear weapons. Uh, the ultimate goal, the ultimate weapons, nuclear weapons. Uh, in terms of crossing the threshold, uh, uh, let me just mention really what should be clear from my remarks so far, the characteristics of a dangerously violent cult of this kind. Uh, it doesn't mean that every cult that shows any of these characteristics fits into this category of a murderous cult or a violent cult, but it does mean that if you have most of these characteristics, we should look out and be wary. Uh, the first characteristic is, what it, is the totalized guruism that I mentioned, which becomes paranoid guruism, megalomanic guruism, a, a very absolute kind of guruism. Uh, second, an apocalyptic event or series of events that destroys the world in the service of renewal. But more than that, the ide ideology of making that happen, of forcing the end, some poa-like ideology, so that one helps it to happen. And then a characteristic that I call the relentless impulse toward world-rejecting world purification. The world is evil and polluted and must be rejected and destroyed in a very different way. Heaven's Gate felt that way in its mass suicide. We, we should distrust anybody with excessive hatred for the world. Um, another characteristic is what I call the, the lure of ultimate weapons, which I've described, and the action prophecy. One doesn't only make prophecies, but one seeks to carry them out. That's what Asahara was doing. The prophecy of the end of the world wasn't enough. One wanted to help make that happen. And, and finally, a shared state of aggressive numbing. You cut off the outside world and aggressively uh, engage in some sort of process that can even take the form of killing with the idea that you're going through an ordeal, something like what Heinrich Himmler, the notorious Nazi killer, said to his SS generals um, in praising them for their courage uh, in killing so many Jews. He said, people who haven't done this don't understand how difficult it is to see hundreds of thousands of bodies in front of one. In other words, it's an ordeal for the killer which ennobles him. That kind of psychology can occur in this kind of cultic extremity. And finally, the whole thing is packaged in a science, a claim of there's extreme technocratic manipulation, there's a, a claim of scientific validity, which uh, Asahara was very intent on, not just for the weapons, but also for um, proving the spiritual achievement by studying brain waves and other scientific means. Now, I'm not going to talk about the characteristics of Japanese culture. There really isn't time, because I want to say something about the American scene. Uh, but certain aspects of Japanese historical experience, the extraordinary confusions and dislocations of the past 150 years contributed to the creation of OM, including the most extreme experience of Japan, uh, total devastation in World War II, and inability to confront its own atrocities in the name of the emperor committed uh, during that war. All these contributed to uh, Ohm's appearance in Japan, along with the apocalyptic subculture that led to all the intense uh, interest in Nostradamus, and all the apocalyptic Japanese products, whether it's Godzilla or even, even uh, Pokemon has a kind of apocalyptic uh, kind of policy, uh, process of the destroying of the world and re, uh, renewing it. But uh, my the point to keep in mind here is that, yes, this occurred in Japan first in this extreme way for these historical and cultural reasons, but 
any culture on this earth is capable of producing an ohm. It is not uniquely a Japanese phenomenon. Uh, it occurred in Japan. We see uh, parallels to it. Uh, let me mention a few in this country, just very briefly. Uh, if you go back to the Charles Manson cult in 1969, of course we know that Manson was a criminal thug, but he was also an apocalyptic figure, a Christ figure in his own eyes and that of his disciples, who had the idea of an activist Armageddon, of forcing the end, which in American society would take the form of a race war. That's why he had his disciples write in blood on the wall of the Polanski uh, mansion, pigs, the death of the pigs, the ostensible idea that this is written by blacks, the whites will turn on blacks, the, the blacks will turn on whites, and we'll have a race war, and that will bring about Armageddon, and Manson would then rule. I mean, it's not logical, but it's, the, it's a parallel to Asahara's idea that I mentioned to you. Uh, I know you've heard about the People's Temple in Guyana from uh, people who know much more about it than I do, but uh, in that experience of taking the lives of 922 people, and as you've heard, ha at least half of them were murdered, and the other half perhaps suicidal, if that number, and it ended up whites killing blacks in that situation, ironically because uh, Jones was in initially uh, a social activist who believed in racial harmony and tried to bring it about. But there was an ideology or a theology of revolutionary suicide. By this collective suicide, one could immortalize the revolution that Jones saw himself and People's Temple as at the heart of. Uh, and uh, if you think about Manson or Jim Jones, they were both very sensitive about nuclear weapons. Jim Jones, as you know, changed the locale of his church, his group, a couple of times largely because he thought that the new locale would be safer in the nuclear war that was expected. But neither Manson nor Jones imagined possessing nuclear weapons. They saw themselves as victims. After living with nuclear weapons for half a century and their uh, becoming uh, more technologically advanced and miniaturized, we can now, in small groups, can imagine possessing them. And I call this uh, the trickle-down effects of nuclear weapons, or trickle-down nuclearism. It's the only Reagan term I ever used. <laughs> of course, suicide and murder can be combined, and you see that very much. Uh, a lot depends upon the psychology of the guru and the theology as to whether the group uh, explodes into external violence or suicide or some combination of both. And one could see the suicidal tendency in Heaven's Gate without going into that in detail. What's striking about Heaven's Gate the parallels with Om Shanti, even though it's a totally different kind of cult, the centrality of the Book of Revelation and the sense of the earth uh, being spaded under, as they said, and the earth uh, being destroyed with this immortalizing process of uh, reaching the next level through this mass suicide. And finally, uh, the right-wing fanatics in this society, who are the most dangerous of all, if you think of Timothy McVeigh and his murderous act at Oklahoma City, of course, he set off uh, a fertilizer bomb, which is relatively low tech, but the book in which he read about the fertilizer bomb uh, was much more than that. Uh, it was the Trinidad Diary, which is uh, a kind of American mind Kampf. And in that book, uh, there's a vast apocalyptic war in which the, quote, white race rebels against the present government, which is too favorable to blacks and Jews, and kills all blacks and then uh, all non-whites and all Jews, first in America and then throughout the world. It's the most apocalyptic uh, vision imaginable. Uh, so that, uh, and it's all in the service of renewing the world to create a perfect world because a perfectly white world. So these ideas are around. In this case, we can speak of the text as guru. Uh, but right there, uh, there's a guru in the wings because the text finally honors, uh, in a very cute little fashion, Adolf Hitler. Uh, as the inspiration for it all. It is a neo-Nazi uh, document. Well, uh, we can see these dangers, something of a dark cultural underground in this culture, and in that sense, uh, Asahar is a kind of caricature. He's not totally removed from the rest, but he's a caricature, uh, the most extreme kind of figure, but who bears some relationship to these other groups and figures, as I've tried to uh, describe. But Ohm is the first group in history to combine ultimate fanaticism and ultimate weapons in a project to destroy the world. So what do we do about this? Well, there's no simple formula. 
But one very strong principle, which people in this room are very aware of, is to be wary of any group or person who claims the only or the complete truth. Uh, as Albert Camus has written, he who does not know everything cannot kill everything. It's in the claim to absolute knowledge uh, that the murderous processes can be nurtured. It is important to keep in mind also that cultic totalism and apocalyptic violence are by no means the only paths available to us and that our own more protean sensibilities can create alternative attitudes and actions. Again, that's what I think uh, this group stands for. Uh, alternative sources of life power and larger human connectedness that uh, require not the status quo rigidities, but rather continuous imaginative efforts to locate ourselves in a confusing world and not to become superhuman as these cultic groups promise uh, and, and claim to become, uh, but rather as beings who do not seek to become superhuman, but rather to sustain our own humanity. Let me close with two quotations which say these things uh, better than I can. Um, one of them is sometimes called Buddhist, but nobody can quite locate it in the Buddhist scripture. It still has great truth for us. Each man is given a set of keys which can open the gates of heaven. The same keys, however, can open the gates of hell. And finally, uh, Gerson Sholem again, the story is not over. It has not yet become history, and the secret life it holds may break out tomorrow in you or in me. Thank you very much.
would you see Osama bin Laden as an example? Um, well, I don't know enough about him. Uh, I don't know about his status as a guru. Certainly he's interested in terrorism, but I don't have the precise knowledge of him or his operation to really answer that question. Um, why did our government hold back in, in deferential asking in the Senate uh, the point of, about Ohm or cult issues? Oh, I don't think, if you read the Senate report on Ohm Shinrikyo, nothing is held back. That's a very good report. It's a very honest report. There may be people, uh, you know, in the Senate. Pardon me? We're thinking of after that. that you oh, do I see. After that. Well, um, what, what I would say is that uh, there, there's no clear answer, no single answer to that, why afterwards there isn't more attention to cultic behavior. Um, cult, cultic behavior is very much a problem in a democracy. We all know that. <laughs> Because, uh, because uh, cultic behavior can be nasty and dangerous, but it isn't illegal until it violates the law. That's why it's a serious problem in a democracy as to how to cope with it. And you have to always balance your approach to cultic behavior, and one shouldn't hold back on knowledge or analyses of the kind that I've tried to provide in my book and in this talk. On the other hand, one has to recognize that uh, the each individual group has to be looked at specifically in terms of whether it is breaking laws. So the hope is that these uh, studies can sensitize people to these cults. Uh, I think that there's much more education that can be done, but I wouldn't minimize the amount that education has already achieved about cult behavior in this society. I know that it sometimes seems as if the cults are all over and, and we're making no pro progress, but uh, a lot of people, and perhaps especially young people, have more wariness toward cults because of educational processes that they've been exposed to. Um, and uh, beyond that, I mean, there may be political allegiances or, or political reasons why there haven't been more expressions, but in the end, this is a cultural and psychological problem that has to be addressed politically at certain moments, but can't be primarily solved politically. That's my, my sense of it. Uh, other questions? Uh, it isn't Ohm gaining a large number of converts now? Father of a daughter teaching junior high school students in Northwest Japan. Well, Ohm is now thought to have about 2,000 people. Uh, there's a whole strange process going on with Ohm. Uh, it, it may be falling apart, yet it's remarkable that a group which has done the things I mentioned can have 2,000 members. Only a, a minority of them are close to Ohm. Others may be uh, much more amorphously tied in with the cult. But that, I think, uh, test is a, uh, testifies to the degree of alienation in Japan. Uh, the culture is very troubling to many young people, and, and the government has been uh, fairly corrupt for a long time. And all these aspects contribute to uh, deep resentments which can be taken out in embrace of cultic behavior. Uh, right now there are struggles within Ohm. Uh, the, the man who came out recently, uh, a man named Joyu, is the leading figure in Ohm who didn't have a long prison term because he hadn't been involved in the killing operations. And he has taken over de facto leadership, but he's at odds with some of Asahara's family. Uh, and then there are some problems within the Asahara family, and it's very hard. The, the own people are caught in a bind because they cannot renounce their guru. They say that he is still a spiritual personage, and he's a genius spiritually. On the other hand, they renounce his crimes and even apologize for them. Well, the whole combination doesn't hold for most of the Japanese public as it shouldn't. Uh, and, uh, and the group is not strong now. It has made a lot of money selling computers and the government is forcing it through the new law to, uh, to channel those uh, profits uh, into uh, funds for, for their victims. Um, can you comment on the cultic nature of the Nazi psychiatrists who began the Holocaust via their campaign against uh, 
life devoid of value. Uh, well, you have, to be, you have to be rather specific about this. Uh, I studied Nazi doctors and wrote a book uh, about them, including Nazi psychiatrists who have uh, a lot to answer for in their role in the, um, in the Holocaust. But often, and so I, I, I describe that in great detail, I describe the conflicts that went on in Nazi doctors and how their behavior could sometimes uh, overcome those conflicts, unfortunately, for them to do what they did. But sometimes this is used as a way of denouncing all psychiatry, which I think is wrong, because uh, there are psychiatrists and there are psychiatrists, and uh, psychiatry can also be a, a helpful profession, as I feel, it's my profession, and it's from my training in this profession that some of the potential uh, ideas and insights uh, that I've tried to bring you derive. Um, You mentioned that a cult leader can be a con artist and a believer of his own cause. Since they sound like opposites, how can this be? Uh, the individual mind can contain opposites. That's what's so confusing. And to some young people, especially in the early days of Om Shinrikyo, Asahara was all the positive, dignified components that I mentioned. But over time, he became all those negative and murderous uh, dimensions. They can coexist in the same mind. And perhaps particularly in gurus, because their, their claim to absolute virtue is so strong, it can uh, sustain in them uh, very powerful patterns that I call uh, charisma. Uh, and at the same time, their megalomania and paranoia can be bound up with all those destructive and murderous uh, elements. So they can coexist even though they're opposite in tendency. Uh, do you think that the increase in cult suicide, Solar Temple, Om Shinrikyo, Heaven's Gate, Branch Davidians, uh, is related to age, is related to aging, disappointment, and deterioration of leaders? Well, I think it's related to different things. There's no one cause. Um, I think that, um, as I said before, the ideology or theology that a cult embraces has a lot to do with whether it takes a suicidal path or a uh, violent path. And, and that ideology is often bound up with the guru's individual psychology. Now there are, you might say, historical and cultic traditions for both, uh, for, for cultic suicides. And in, in other studies that I've done of suicide, I find that often suicide is a quest for some kind of immortality. One tries to leave a mark through suicide, and cultic leaders exploit this. Uh, and so they do it collectively. One tries to leave a mark in a way that one was unable to do in one's own active life. And that mark one wants to last forever in an immortalizing way. Uh, I think that these tendencies increase uh, in, in connection with leaders, but also in connections with strains in the society and dislocations that I mentioned before. Uh, and in that way, the cultic problem is never a simple one. It's not simply a psychiatric problem. It has very social and historical dimensions that I've always tried to emphasize and that enter into uh, these patterns. Uh, uh, there was one last question which uh, may not be friendly, but I want to answer it anyhow. Uh, wasn't Asahara a patient of Ewan Cameron? I don't know how many of you know about it. Yeah, okay. Uh, I hate to challenge a paradigm, but this uh, I'll answer it. Uh, oh, oh, God forbid. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll I'm really sorry that you feel so, so, yeah. so squelched. But anyhow, Dylan uh, yeah. uh, Cameron uh, was a psychiatrist in Canada who had CIA connections and uh, performed brainwashing-like experiments on patients. Uh, the CIA was sued. I actually testified on behalf of victims uh, for, uh, against the CIA in terms of, a, uh, of restitution, which they eventually succeeded. So what this does show is that the CIA became enormously involved in thought reform-like or brainwashing-like uh, behavior. And, uh, and it was a very uh, unfortunate time in American society that it was so widely, it had a kind of fascination for the CIA as they learned about uh, communist prisoners confessing through false confessions. And the CIA made the mistake of wanting to embrace the method rather than to reject it. In the end, at least, uh, with all the faults of this society, and I uh, have to speak of myself as usually a critic, uh, there was at least the possibility 
of some form of rectification, some form of exposing CIA behavior and bringing it to some legal fruition or some legal uh, resolution. But that's uh, a pattern that has to be recognized and, uh, and one has to relate Cameron, uh, CIA influences and certain psychiatrists to the involvement in thought reform like behavior and one should, uh, from the standpoint of psychiatry and professions and democracy, oppose them. Okay, thanks very much.